All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to this month, um, Visual Builder Office Hours. And this month, we're going to talk about the new features in Oracle Visual Builder Studio. Um, this month's release basically rolled out over the weekend. It's version 2307, some very exciting new features in this version. My name is Shai Schmelzer, part of the product management team. And with me today is also Blaine and Anthony. They are monitoring the Q&A panel. So if at any point during this session you have any questions, uh, there's a little Q&A uh, part in the Zoom. Just post your questions over there. We'll try to answer them during the session uh, or maybe at the end of the session um, if we have any leftover questions. So before we start to talk about the new features, just some news from the community around Visual Builder. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on on a daily basis. Uh, you can check us on our forums and places like that. I uh, wanted to highlight some of the um, new material that um, is out there. So first of all, on our blog at blogs.oracle.com slash VBCS, there's a bunch of new entries that we put in over the past month, uh, everything that uh, that ranges from covering things like how to create reusable components in Visual Builder, including examples of how to include a map component in your application, a connection to OneDrive, uh, aspects of connecting to the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, how to run Terraform scripts as part of your build process. Uh, in the Redwood area, we have um, a new entry that covers the guided process template, which is one of the more um, visually appealing uh, templates as part of the Redwood set of components covering how you create multi-step multi wizards in your user interface. And we also cover things like passing values uh, to fragments, uh, role mapping when you do a uh, deployment through Visual Builder Studio and a lot more. So if you're not checking it on a regular basis, we do recommend every now and then go over to the blogs.oracle.com slash VBCS, check out the uh, news feed and see what's new. And beyond us at Oracle um, blogging about stuff, a lot of the community has started to blog and you can see some of the URLs over here. Uh, you can always watch the replay and just click on the URLs or uh, go to them. We'll put them in the comments for this video. And those are just some of the community members, developers just like you sharing their information, sharing their knowledge, uh, giving you tips and uh, showing you how they do stuff. So um, if you are interested, check those out. Uh, you might find some useful things over there. Um, there's also a couple of solutions that have been published from Oracle. One of them is about developing web applications that modify PDF documents. It's basically an example of a VB application that manipulates PDF documents, which is something a lot of us um, need to do. Uh, for example, generating PDFs and modifying the content. And we also have um, a solution around creating low-code decision intelligence applications. So this is an example that you can find out there uh, that deals with uh, intelligence uh, decision-making integrated into Visual Builder. So a combination of the Oracle Cloud Analytics and Visual Builder. In terms of events, uh, the big events that is coming up, of course, is Cloud World. This is coming up in September in Vegas. Um, we're going to have several sessions over there. We're going to have hands-on lab, demo ground, and a lot of activities over there. And one thing that we would love to do is feature you over there. So if you have a nice experience with Visual Builder, uh, big applications that you developed, extensions to Oracle Fusion apps, we are interested in hearing your story. We might be able to get you to co-present with us in some of our sessions. Uh, so ping me directly um, and let me know if you are interested in participating. Uh, again, it's September in Vegas. It's a great conference to be in. Uh, before that, at the end of June, we have K-Scope. This is the uh, Oracle Developer Tools User Group conference. They have a yearly conference. And this year, they added a new track that is all about extending Oracle Cloud apps. Um, uh, Blaine is going to be there from our team, and a lot of other partners and customers are going to be there to share their experience around how you build extensions to Oracle apps with Visual Builder. So again, it's uh, happening here in the US. If you're interested, um, check it out. All right. So that was a little bit of an overview. Just uh, one thing to mention here. How do you keep up with all those news? One of the great ways is to join our LinkedIn group. We have a group on LinkedIn called the Visual Builder Group. Um, just join in there and we post news item there. All those things are 
um, mentioned over there, uh, it's a great way again to be part of the active community. All right, so let's talk about release 2307. It's a Visual Builder Studio release and there's a lot of features there. So first of all, just to remind everyone, uh, there's two products, the Visual Builder Studio and there's Visual Builder. This release is the Visual Builder Studio release. Visual, and the way that we are working from now on is Visual Builder Studio is gonna have a quarterly release and the Visual Builder service, which is the runtime, is going to have a release every six months. Okay, so this release is just for Visual Builder Studio, but remember that Visual Builder Studio is a free entitlement. You can just spin up an instance and hook it up to your existing Visual Builder instance. Um, that would give you the ability to leverage all of those features that we're going to talk about today, right now on top of your existing Visual Builder, whether it's standalone or part of Oracle Integration Cloud. Um, if you're not using Visual Builder Studio, you would need to wait for release 2310 to get the features that we're going to talk about today. But we do recommend using Visual Builder Studio. It gives you a lot more benefits, um, not just the new feature, but in aspects like integration with Git repository, automating your continuous integration and deployment, a lot of features that are in there uh, that are free for you as an Oracle Cloud customer. Uh, if you don't know what Visual Builder Studio is, by the way, um, check the replay of the office hour from last week. We did a whole hour on Visual Builder Studio and how it can help you develop Visual Builder applications. Anyway, in release 2307, we updated to use Oracle Jet version 14. And there's, of course, the parallel Oracle Visual Builder runtime version that comes with it, set of the runtime libraries that sits on the client. And um, when you'll open your application in the new version, you'll be prompted um, to suggest an upgrade. We do encourage people to upgrade and stay up to date with the latest version. One thing that we did in this release, we extended a little bit our update uh, upgrade policy. Okay. So up until now, we the UI for the design time was supporting the current version and three versions back. Now we extended it to support four versions back. So this would give you basically a year um, to stay on a specific version, but then you would have to upgrade uh, to keep the design time features working for you. In any case, we always recommend to upgrade those new features that you get. There's uh, aspects of performance and security in each new version as well. So keeping up with the latest version is always, always a good thing to do. So once you upgrade or once you open your application in 2307, one of the biggest features that you're going to see is JavaScript action chain. So we are all familiar with action chains and how you develop business logic on the client side in Visual Builder. You drag and drop declarative actions to create the business logic on your application. Up until now, when you created action chain, what was actually created behind the scene is a JSON file that had the metadata about the actions, their order, uh, which action leads to which other action. And you would see it in a diagram view in the design time. In the new version, we switched from using JSON to using actual JavaScript as what is being generated from the design time, okay? And the design time has also gotten updated instead of using a diagram, we are now using this code block approach that you can see on the right side. Okay, it says a um, pattern that is very familiar with all sorts of tools that are aiming to simplify the way that you look and work with code, gives you a very easy access. Uh, it's also much easier to look at your code this way, uh, especially when you have a lot of code in your application. Action chains tended to become very small and you needed to zoom in and navigate around. This approach with the ability to also collapse areas of the code is much easier, okay? Because we are now creating JavaScript, first of all, when you switch to the code view, you can actually see the JavaScript and you can work at the JavaScript level. You can add an if then else, you can add a for loop and if uh, a while loop and any other JavaScript structure you want. You can code in JavaScript with a helpful editor and you can still drag and drop the actions into the code view as well. The biggest advantage, however, comes at time when you need to debug your code. 
So up until now, when you tried to debug and figure out what's wrong with your action chain, most of you relied on the messages that came up in the console to figure out what's happening. But now you actually have JavaScript in your browser where you can use the JavaScript debugger. So you can set breakpoints in your action chains, you can examine variables, you can set watches on variables and do everything else that normal JavaScript developers use to develop their application, debug them. One of the nice things is you can at runtime, you can modify your JavaScript code, save it and actually see the behavior after the change. So at runtime, you can see uh, if your fixes are going to fix stuff, okay? Um, everything is still declarative. So all the productivity you had before is still there with a lot more productivity at the um, debugging step, okay? One other thing to note, um, all your action chains that are currently in JSON are going to stay in JSON. We are not touching them. They still function. You can still even create new JSON action chains if you really want to, okay? Uh, but we do recommend from now on just create JavaScript action chains, okay? A JavaScript action chain can also invoke an existing action chain that was written in JSON, okay? The other way, by the way, doesn't work, but if you're creating a new JavaScript action chain, it can call an existing JSON action chain. All right. So again, two views into your code. One is the visual code block approach. Okay. The other one is the code view. And you can see actual JavaScript. In both cases, you still have all the declarative aspects that you can drag and drop. You have a structure pane that lets you easily navigate your code and you have the property inspector that allows you to set properties for actions that you're calling. The big advantage again is during runtime, you can set breakpoints using the developer tools of your browser, set breakpoints, uh, um, look into variables, expand the, uh, the scopes of variables and see exactly what's going on in a very, developer friendly way, okay? One of the other advantages of JavaScript as the mechanism is it makes uh, the whole integration with Git a lot more trivial. You're actually looking at code when you're doing, for example, code merges, it makes it a lot clearer what is actually happening in the code, um, makes the whole development experience much more native to people who are coming from a developer back background. All right, so um, let's see this in action. So I'm inside Visual Builder Studio. This is, again, release 2307. Uh, you can always check your version by going over here, doing about, and you'll see the version that you're on. And we have a workspace over here. I'm gonna open the workspace in a new window, and this will take us into the visual development environment. And we have a little sample application where we're looking into um, employees and their data, and we're going to take an existing page and we're going to modify it. So right now we have here a table of employees. We want to be able to edit each employee. So we're going to take um, the employee object from our business object view over here and drag it to the right to create an edit form. Okay, so, Basically, just the same development approach that you had before. And nothing changes here. Um, you need an employee ID. So we're going to add a variable here. We'll call it employee ID. And we're going to map this over here and over here. All right. So this creates the edit form. We need to set a value for the employee ID. So we can actually set a default value, for example, of two. All right, and then we'll actually see data in here in the form. Okay, so um, what is new here? The new thing is that when you created this, and for example, there's a save button that was created for you to save the data. If you look at the event and the action chain that is mapped to it, this is what you'll see now. Okay, so you'll see the same code structure um, in the new block approach. Okay. On the left side, you can actually see a breakdown of what is happening here, okay? So if you expand this, you can see, for example, initially we're checking if we are uh, in a status of saving, then we're calling an action chain to validate the form. 
then we're checking if things are validated and if it's true, if it's valid, then we're calling the update employee. So you can see the whole logic happening over here from the structure pane. And when you click on one of these actions, you can see all the properties over here as well. And the nice thing is that if you switch to the code view, you can actually see the code that is being called here, all your JavaScript. So let's see, for example, how you would define a new piece of JavaScript in your code, okay? So for example, let's say we want to do validation on the salary field, okay? So each employee can belong to a department and a department can have a maximum uh, salary at this department. So we want to check that the salary that we're updating for an employee is inside the range of salaries allowed for a specific department. So to do that, we're gonna pick the uh, salary field and just like before, we're going to create a, an event on the value change, okay? And the first thing we're going to check is we're going to check if the employee is actually belongs to a department. So we're going to check here in a condition if the employee department is not null because initially it might be null, okay? So if it's not null, what we want to do is we want to call a REST service to figure out what's the maximum salary in this department. So we're gonna select uh, and from our business object, from the department, we're going to get the information about the department. We're going to pass in the department ID that the employee belongs to. Uh, so this would be this one. So as you can see, in terms of working with the actions, it's all the same thing. You, you still work in a declarative way, okay? But the representation is done in code blocks like you're seeing over here, okay? All right, so we call the department, then the results, we can put them inside the variable. So we'll, this is the name that was created by default. We can, for example, call the variable, the depth info variable, okay? Um, the other thing, by the way, that you can do for the whole action is you can define a new name for this action. So we can call this, for example, the validate salary action, like that, okay? While you're doing all of this, code is being created at the backend. Okay, so here's your class, the validate salary class. Inside it, there's a run function. This is what is actually being called when you invoke the action. You can pass in parameters. The parameters that we're passing right now is the value. If you need more parameters, you can add more parameters into your action chain. We have the, con uh, the context of the page, the flow, and the application over here. And then we have our code. The code is basically check if there's a department, if there is a department, call the REST service passing in this value, okay? So exactly what we defined in the design view is also there in the code view, okay? All right, so once we uh, get the department uh, information, we want to again check if there's, uh, if the salary is inside the range. So we're gonna invoke our um, little expression validator. And from the department info, we're going to get the max salary. And we're going to check whether it's smaller than the salary that we gave the employee. Okay. So this is again an if. If it's, um, if it's smaller, then we have a problem. So we're going to fire a notification. Put it in here. And we'll say salary is out of range, okay? Yeah, please fix it. Okay, something like that, right? Um, so this is our little business logic now. Um, and again, this whole thing is also available for you over here in the code view. And by the way, you can also do things directly in the code view, uh, drag and drop stuff over there. Maybe we'll see it later on. Let's complete our form. Uh, one thing we want to do here is when the table, when we select the record here, so let's enable row selection. And when we select the record, we want to set, we'll do an assign variable and we'll set the employee ID variable to be the selected row key. Okay, and again, this is an action chain in code view. It's basically just a variable assignment, very easy, right? So go back to the page. We now go into live mode and we click on Dave. Uh, we'll get Dave's information over here. Let's run this for a second in our browser. Okay. 
we get the list of employees, click on Jane, set Jane to work in a specific department, and then we can try and increase her salary, and we get our notification working here. So this is working as expected. If you wanted to debug something, okay, you can actually just go over here, do inspect, under the source code, okay, you will find your application up here, okay, with the structure of your application, okay, so you can see the flow for the employee, you can see the page, we have the employee start page, which is the page we're working on, if you expand this, you can see all the chains here, here's our validate salary action chain, here's the code, and we can basically set a breakpoint now, so for example, we can set a breakpoint on this if statement over here, okay? So now if we go over and we modify the salary again, and we leave the field, we hit our breakpoint, I can hover over the max salary and see that the max salary in the department is 6,000. I can hover over the employee salary, I can see it's 20,000, therefore we'll go into this business logic over here, right? So we'll actually show the notification. Now, if I notice that the notification is not helpful enough because I don't know what the range is, I can actually go over to my code and I can change it. For example, um, I can go over here and say max is, and then add the value of the variable. Okay, and again, the way that you reference a variable is just copy this um, reference to the variable, put it in here, and then you can click save. So now that I save this, if I now go over and I type again an invalid value, I hit the breakpoint, I keep running, and now I get the actual information over here about the max salary, okay? So as you can see, very easy to work, set breakpoints, exp uh, explore variables. You have all the scope aspects over here as well. So for example, if I set a breakpoint here, and again, I'll, um, change the um, variable. You can see the scopes, you can get to your page variables, to your um, flow variables, everything is available over here. You can see the value um, that was passed into the validate salary. So full debugging capabilities for your application built into here. Don't forget to remove breakpoints and click run if you want to continue, All right? So this is a little bit about, again, JavaScript action chain. Um, it's a very, it's a feature that we've been working on for a long time. It's very exciting for us and it's going to make your life as a developer much, much easier going forward. Okay. Um, again, uh, just to show you some other stuff on the action chains. Oh, actually, we'll show it later on. So um, we'll get to it in a few minutes. Let's move on to the next feature. The next feature, feature is track modify variables. Okay. So again, this is a feature that a lot of you have requested, and that's the ability to know when the value of a variable has changed in your page. And this is now something that you can achieve in a declarative way. We can track specific variables. You tell us which variables to track, and we can then let you know if the variable has changed. Okay? This would make it very easy for you, for example, to create um, situations where before someone navigates to another page, you or does something in, a, in the screen and you have unsaved changes, you can notify them about this. And all you need to do is set the dirty data behavior on a specific variable to track that variable. So let's again, let's come back to our application over here. <clears throat> and one of the things that can happen is people can at runtime, they can switch between employees. But what happened if they um, modify the value of an employee and click switch without saving, okay? Um, then we are not basically telling them, hey, you didn't save the data, okay? So maybe we want to fire up this notification. Whenever you click on an employee here, we want to check if the values in this page, in this section of the page have changed. So to do that, what we're going to do, this whole form, each one of the fields here, is based on this variable called employees. So we can go over to the variable, um, which is called employees, which has all those properties. 
And there's a property here called dirty data behavior, and we can turn on tracking on this. So from now on, Visual Builder would track this variable and see if the value has changed. <clears throat> now we need to evaluate whether the value has changed. We can evaluate this, for example, in this event that we have here for the table when we select a record. So before we set a, the new employee ID variable, we want to check what's the status of the dirty data. So we have a new action chain here called get dirty data status that I can bring here to the top. Okay. And then I can do an if statement. All right. So we'll take an if statement, put it here. And in the if statement, I can check the results or the status from the get dirty data. And I can check whether it's equal to dirty. Okay. If it's equal to dirty, I can, for example, fire up a notification over here that says, you have unsaved data. Save before navigating. So this is on the if statement like this. Um, if, by the way, uh, here's how you create a branch for the else. You just drag into that branch over here. And for the branch over here, we're just going to say, if, the, if it's not dirty, then we are okay to navigate. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing we want to do is, hey, maybe the person does want to navigate even without the unsaved changes. So after we show them that they have unsaved changes, we're going to use the uh, reset dirty data status over here to say, okay, from this point on, we're considering this as not dirty. So if they do want to navigate, we still allow them. The other place where we want to reset the dirty data status is when we first set the value of this employee. So this is in the load employee chain. We get the data, we set it into this variable. Uh, and after we set it into the variable, we want to add this um, reset dirty data status for the page. So now again, if we run our little page here, we're gonna get um, the data about an employee. Initially, we are not going to change anything. So if we click on Dave and we don't change anything, we can click on Steve, okay, and switch to Chris. Everything works fine. If we do change something in the page, okay, and we try to click on an employee, we get this warning, you have unsaved data, okay? And we can decide to ignore this and actually do click on Steve and navigate over here. So this is how easy it is now to track changes in variables in your application with the new uh, get dirty data behavior uh, functionality in Visual Builder. Let's talk about some other features. Um, we did some enhancement to fragments. One of the aspects is because fragments are reusable and other developers might be using your fragments, we wanted to make it as easy for them to use your fragment as possible. Um, one of the things we added is the ability to specify for variables that you're using in your fragment to create a matching variable in the page that uses this fragment automatically. Okay. The other thing that we did for variables in a fragment is the ability to, to define various data types for them and also to control how they look like in the property inspector when you're using um, a fragment. Again, all of those would make the consumption of fragments easier for your users. So again, if we move back to our environment over here, let's create a new fragment. For example, if we had the AMP picture fragment, okay, and we wanted over here just to show a picture of someone, so we can bring in an avatar, okay, and make it with a different color and a different size and a different shape. Okay, maybe this is our standard now, and we want this to be used elsewhere. So one of the things we need here is we need a variable that would contain the image URL. So we'll create a variable at the fragment. We'll call this one pick URL. Okay. And we can mark this to be an input variable um, into our fragment. 
okay? Once you do this, if you go over to your variables, you can also mark this little checkbox that says create this variable in the container. And this will create it in the containing page. Um, again, this is a variable of type string. I'm gonna add a few other variables that I'm not actually going to use, but if we were to also choose the color, <clears throat> this again can be a, an input variable um, for our application that we create in the container. And we can then in the design time, specify a subtype. For example, say, hey, this is actually a color that someone needs to say. And we can say, a, a, for example, a label. So uh, we can call it background color. Okay. And we'll add one more thing. Maybe there's a max salary or max sal variable, which would be a number. Okay. And again, we can create this as an input variable and control in the design time um, how it will be displayed. Okay. Uh, minimum and maximum, for example, zero to 4,000, something like that. Okay. Now, those are things that you set on the design time for a specific variable. Also, if you look at the fragment itself, there's a design time for the fragment where you can set sections for the variables. So for example, you can have the mandatory variable. Okay. And over here, we'll have the pick URL and you can have the optional section. And over here, we can add the color and the max salary. So like that. Right. So all of this was done in our little fragment. Now, if we go back to our page and we want to use this fragment, we'll pick up the AMP picture fragment and we'll drag and drop it. So we'll drag and drop it into the form. So over here, right? Um, just up here. Okay. So we added it into the page. Note that we have now over here, our mandatory section and the optional section, okay? The other thing that was created for us in variables now, we have the pick URL variable that was created for us and it is already automatically mapped into the variable value over here, okay? So this is, again, simplification of how you consume uh, fragments in a page and better control over how the fragment is displayed in the design time. All right, let's go back to the slides, <clears throat> cover a little bit more features. Um, one of the area that we enhanced is the audit pane. So again, as you work on your code, we always audit it, make sure that, it, uh, that it's okay, that we don't have any issues there and we'll show you the audits in an audit pane. One of the things we did now is we rearranged the layout here to be tree-based and to show you your pages first. So um, when you look over here in the audit, it's now based on page. So you can actually look up specific page and the issues that we see in this page. So this is part of our auditing enhancement. All right, let's talk about some enhancement in the projects area, in the whole uh, CI-CD DevOps area over there. So again, one of the big ticket items that we added here is an approval step that you can have in a pipeline. Okay, so pipelines basically allow you to automate the execution of steps in your um, DevOps cycle. Okay, so for example, you can package an application, deploy an application, stuff like that. We now added a feature that allows you to add a step that is a manual approval by someone in your organization. So for example, if you want to automate everything, but before you do a deployment to production, you want a manager to actually press approve and approve something, we now have a way for you to do this in your design time. So if we go back into our project view and we look into um, our pipeline that exists over here for deployment. Um, and we can edit this pipeline. Okay. You can now go over here and say, hey, let's add a step for a manual approval. Okay. So manual approval. And then you can say, hey, once it is approved, 
we want to do a, a new step over here. Okay, so for example, we want to do a deploy to QA. But we only want to do the deployment to QA if we got approval. Okay. Over here, you can edit the approvals um, for this step. In order to have the approvals, you need to do a change at the project level. Okay. Um, under the um, build section, there's a section for pipeline approvals. And you can create default set of approvals. Okay, you can create your own approvals. So for example, QA approvals. And then from your team, you can pick the people who would approve this thing and which pipeline this relates to. So from now on, when I run this pipeline, if there's an approve step, those guys are going to get an email and they're going to need to take an action and approve the build step in order for it to execute. I can try and run this um, and you'll see the results. So again, I, I'm not sure that you'll see that I'm going to get an email uh, once we hit that step and then I can come in and approve this. So while this is running, we can continue with some of the other things. Okay. Um, merge requests for issues. So. Um, part of the Visual Builder Studio environment is an issue tracking system, which allows you to document all your to-dos and basically track everything that your team is doing, prioritize it, and then also manage it with agile dashboards and manage sprints and stuff like that. One thing we introduce now is the ability to associate a specific code branch and a merge request for this code branch with an issue directly from the issue interface. So for example, if we are looking at the list of issues that we need to fix, there's an issue here to add a location-based search feature. One of the things I can do here is I can link a merge, merge request, okay? So I can say, hey, for this repository, okay, I would want to merge into main whatever is in the new branch that I'm creating here. So this would be, for example, location fix branch. Okay. So this would actually create the branch for me. Okay. I can then say, hey, beyond me approving it, Jeff also needs to approve any changes in this branch. It's already linked to the issue. Okay. And we can add description if we need to. And then if we click create, this creates the branch for us. So we now have a branch called uh, location fix, okay, over here in our Git repository. Okay, we also have a merge request ready for us to go over and merge anything from here. So if we now do work in this branch, it would go into this merge request, um, and we can then uh, notify people, hey, you need to approve those changes. Okay. So this is a nice utility that allows you to more easily uh, create this relationship between a branch of your code and the issue that it represents and the merge request that is involved. Another thing that happens in merge request now is that you can add attachments. So in a merge request, you can of course see the code changes that people did. But now you can also associate with this merge request all sorts of files. For example, maybe what you're merging in here is some changes to the user interface that are based on some UI design that you got. You can attach this screenshot um, into the merge request. So again, if we go over to our merge request, there's a section here for attachment and you can go over here, select a file from your hard drive and say, hey, this is based on this new UI design that we needed. And then whoever is looking into your code changes would be able to go over here and actually look at the files and see exactly what's going on um, and understand, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve over here. Okay. Um, we also enhanced the project creation step. And um, one of the things is that there's a new step in project creation. The last step allows you at this stage to add team members. So now 
as part of the project creation, you can say who are the team members. The other thing is that private projects, projects that are marked private, would now show in uh, the project list with the admin of this project. So people who need to join this project can find out, hey, this project exists and then can turn to the admin and request access to this project. And the last point is for developers who are creating extensions and customization of Oracle Fusion apps uh, using this feature in Fusion apps of edit page, uh, we now automatically create the project for you and associate the right workspace with the changes that you're about to do. So the whole flow becomes much smoother with this new release. All right, so let me see if we can show just one more thing. The pipeline is still running. Oh yeah, we failed the deploy, so we didn't get to the approve, but that's okay. Um, if the deploy would have worked, we would have gotten to the approve. All right, let's see if we have any open Q&A uh, questions that we want to take now. Um, Is there a plan to, for a separate Visual Builder Studio learning path at Oracle University? Um, uh, there is a separate course right now for Visual Builder Studio uh, that you can take. It's actually a free Oracle University one. Um, we posted it on the LinkedIn group, but uh, we can post it again. Uh, and it would uh, give you basically the knowledge. In terms of certification, I don't think we have a separate certification for Visual Builder right now. We're also working on a, another training that would be available soon, specifically for people who are extending Oracle Fusion apps uh, with Visual Builder. Um, can we have approvals added dynamically for a pipeline? Yeah, we, you can basically add a group uh, as an approval for a pipeline, and you can then add people to the group and they'll be able to approve. You can also, again, go into the... Uh, into the actual step of the approval step over there, and you can modify the list of approvals um, if you need to modify it dynamically. So if we are looking at the pipeline over here, you can edit the list of approvals over here. Okay, so you can add a new approval over here. You can also have approvals that are required and approvals that are optional. So again, a lot of things that you can do here with the new approval features. Um, all right, let's see if we have any other question. Um, can we externalize parameters in pipeline steps or any other way? So yeah, you can have a pipeline. Um, so if you have parameters in a build job, they would show up at the pipeline when you run it. Um, and the values for those, yeah, you can dynamically provide them when you run the pipeline. You can you will be prompted to insert the variables for the pipeline, and um, so just define parameters on the build job, and they would show up in the pipelines that use this build job. Uh, will JSON action chain be deprecated? We don't have current plans to deprecate action Jackson, uh, sorry JSON action chains. Um, we know there's a lot of system out there with a lot of code written in JSON action chain, so they would continue to function as is. However, new enhancements would only go into JavaScript action chain. So uh, going forward, we do recommend just using JavaScript action chain beyond that aspect of what is supported or not. There's truly a lot of a lot of advantages to this JavaScript approach to action chain. It's going to make your development life much easier going forward. So uh, we highly uh, recommend using those. Again, if you run into any questions or uh, issues with the JavaScript action chains, please let us know on our discussion forum on the Oracle Cloud Customer Connect forum. Uh, we'll be happy to answer all your questions over there as well. Uh, if you have any ideas for enhancement, let us know also over there. All right, I think that's about all the time we had for for today. Um, uh, oh, I see one more question here. Changes done in the debugging code are permanent or temporary to that session? Uh, the change that you do is only for that running session. If you do it from the browser to actually take effect on the code, you need, of course, to do it in the tool itself in the design time. Uh, of the two. 
All right, we're going to have a couple of blog entries showing up over the next couple of days to dig deeper into JavaScript action chain and the other new features on our blog. So uh, keep an eye over there uh, for, uh, for new things. Um, yeah, again, like in terms of cutting over JSONs and making JavaScript mandatory, again, right now, all the action chains that we generate are generated in JavaScript already. Um, when you create an action chain, by default, we create JavaScript action chain. You can specify that you want to create a JSON action chain. We, again, discourage this practice. We really want people to use JavaScript action chain going forward. You're going to love it once you get used to it. So try it out. All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you learned some of the new things that are coming up. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback. Um, post it on our uh, Cloud Customer Connect Forum. Join our LinkedIn group and stay in touch. Thanks everyone and have a great day.